So Don Byrne is this tremendously fascinating character. He's in, for the people who have seen Narcos, um, he's in the second, he's in the second, is it? The second series when he's instrumental in the takedown of Pablo Escobar. Um, and people ask me often about Narcos, and I'll talk for Narcos in Colombia. Is this real? Is this true? When it comes to the actual Narcos themselves, yes, it's basically following real life. What they're presenting in that series is basically real life. Yeah, you know, look, obviously they've hyped up the participation of the Americans. That's a natural. It's for an American audience primarily. But when they're dealing with describing an, the actions of these Colombian narcos, it's pretty truthful. So Don Berner is this, yeah, Don Berner, basically Berner starts out in the EPL, which is the Popular Liberation Army, a guerrilla group. Colombia has countless numbers of guerrilla groups. It's often like, in Colombia, basically people will get pissed off about something and they'll say, all right, let's go to the mountains and start another guerrilla group. I mean, there's just so many of them. Just to give you an example, the ELN was founded to be inspired by the Cuban Revolution. The FARC was inspired by Marxist-Leninism. The EPL was a Maoist group, right? I mean, it's just anything you want, the Colombian guerrillas can be there. He's there in the EPL. He gets attacked by, a, we believe it's a guerrilla, I think. Uh, sorry, a grenade. That's, this gives him a pronounced limp for the rest of his life. He needs a walking stick. He then becomes a driver for these important uh, traffickers in the Medellin cartel. One of them is called Galliano. Galliano is killed by Pablo Escobar in this infamous turning point in the drug war. When Pablo Escobar says he's in the prison that he himself has built, the cathedral, he invites uh, these traffickers over and says, you've been stealing from me, and he kills them. Don Berner was supposed to be in that meeting. He doesn't turn up by luck. Uh, so now he is out for revenge on his bosses. He creates and is instrumental in this organization called Pepes, the persecuted by Pablo Escobar. This is the group that works with the DEA, the CIA, the Colombian police, the army. They all work together to come to take, to bring down Pablo Escobar. And it's one of those things that when Pablo Escobar is finally killed in 1993, the Colombian government says the era of the big drug lord is over. Of course, it wasn't because now we had Don Berner. Don Berner ran Medellin for around from 1993, let's say, until 2008. His will, his word was utterly, it, it, you couldn't question it. And people who tried to at the beginning suffered greatly. People often talk about power. I remember reading Henry Kissinger talking about meeting one of the Assads, the elder Assad. And there was some anecdote about an assistant. I can't remember the details, but an assistant running in saying, President, President, this is urgent. You must look at it. And Assad just silencing the aid as if I'm talking to this person. I will stop time to keep this conversation going. That's power. Don Berner, when he was running Medellin, I would notice if you spoke about him, even in a closed room, people would lower their voice. They would say, well, you know, Don Berner is doing this because no one knew where his spies were. It, you wouldn't, it, you wouldn't, it, it wouldn't occur to you in 2005 to be sitting in a restaurant and loudly talking about Don Berner. That's power. I've never seen it since. I imagine in these, in these uh, savage dictatorships, you've got something similar, but it was true power. Then he joins... Uh, the far right paramilitaries. This is what all of these drug traffickers want to do. They want to launder their image. The position of the Colombian government is it will never negotiate with narcos. So he joins the far right paramilitaries. They unleash this campaign of murderous violence. The worst massacres were carried out by the far right paramilitaries. In wait, the way. wait, 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 wait. He starts off as a far leftist and then he joins yeah. the far right. Uh... Yeah, he joins. Okay. Exactly. And again, this is more common than you think. These guys are never doctrinaire. The FARC would try to instruct the guerrillas, their political class. But often what these guerrilla groups is just looking for loyal fighters. I mean, you would have political conversations with a heavy fighter of the FARC. You're not going far. I mean, these guys are just like, hey, I'm a Marxist Leninist. And you'd say, what does that mean? They would say, I'm. I mean, but they understand it is about redistribution. I don't want to mock them too much because, again, you know, the FARC did try to do their teaching when they could. So, yeah, he does start off as a far right, far, far left. Then he becomes someone called Adolf Peace. <laughs> um, and this is you would see a number of these narcos. There's one who's really funny called Gordo Lindo, which is like Gordo Lindo, like the cute fatty. 
This was this obese guy. Your viewers can't see it, but I'm demonstrating on Skype video. This guy was obese and he would like, he must, I don't know where he ordered his military fatigues, but he had this military like outfit. It was, he would have to squeeze himself in and he would stand there and like try and pretend he was commanding troops in front of the camera. He was what they called a pure blood narco. And he got the name Cute Fatty because he would give every girlfriend a Volkswagen Beetle. And these women, these models would say, oh, Fatty, he's so cute. And that's, so that's Gordolindo, right? So um, it's adorable. Exactly. So all of these narcos, they take over the AUC, the right wing paramilitaries. And that's really interesting because the right, the far right paramilitaries starts off. How long do you have? Do you have a few more minutes? Oh, I got time. All right. I got time. So I just want to tell you about this. Let's just take a little digression. So the far right paramilitaries, they're mainly set up by this family called the Castaniels. If you want to talk about a Greek tragedy all happening to one family, read up on the Castaniel family of Colombia. So it, the main figure is called Rambo. That's his nickname. Fidel Castaniel takes the name Rambo. Their father, their farmers, their father is kidnapped by the FARC. Again, brilliant by the FARC, consistently shooting themselves in the foot. They kidnapped the father and they played this game that they would do so many times. They demanded the ransom. The family paid the ransom. The FARC said, we need another ransom. Rambo said, screw it. I'll take that money and set up a new paramilitary group to kill rebels. They set up the AUC, the far right paramilitaries. Rambo is killed in combat. His brother Carlos takes over. Carlos sets up this political ideological paramilitary unit that is trying to rid the country of um, the Marxist guerrillas, but he needs money. And his brother Vicente starts overseeing drug trafficking. That's their, Carlos is never very happy about this, we think, but he understands the only way to raise funds is cocaine trafficking, but he never wants to do it. Vicente is a cocaine trafficker. Vicente will essentially, when Carlos at some point in around 2002 says, you know what, this trafficking's gone on long enough. I want out of this war. I am going to America to stand trial and show them I am innocent of cocaine trafficking because he never did it personally. Vicente convenes a meeting. Don Berner is there. Vicente, his own brother, says, I think Carlos will be a danger to all of us. I vote we kill Carlos. This is his own brother. And Carlos Castaño, this tremendously important figure, a lunatic. He's in Narco series two as well, a complete lunatic. He's, there's a scene in, that really encapsulates Carlos Castaño in Narcos, which is good. He's walking down the street and they've done this raid in Medellin, one of Pablo Escobar's uh, neighborhoods. And he walks up to some dude and he shoots him in the back of the head and says, for Colombia. And this is the type of lunatic he genuinely was. So Don Berner is one of the narcos who infiltrates this far right paramilitary group. And he achieves tremendous success and he's trying to launder his image. And in 2008, as part of a peace process with the government, this is what the narcos have all been aiming for, a peace process with the government where they can clean their image, they can keep some of their money. The problem is them and the government can't come to terms about what the peace deal should be. The government wants a pretty serious eight years in prison well, it's not that serious. It can be at their own kind of farms. But the, par the paramilitaries are saying that's too much. The paramilitaries start to hint that they have a lot of information about which were the politicians, generals, colonels who worked with them. And they start hinting that they're prepared to share that information. Overnight, the government extradites 10, 15 of the most important paramilitaries to the US where they all were convicted of cocaine trafficking. Don Berner, got a 32-year sentence. Now, where does Don Berner sit at the moment? I would speak to narcos in Medellin, even a couple of years ago, I said, what would happen if Don Berner came back? These narcos told me if Don Berner wanted it, they thought people in Medellin would step aside. I don't know if Don Berner would want it. He would be under the microscope. I don't know how he would get away with it, but that's the respect they still hold for this tremendously important figure. Step aside in a way where there would be kind of, I mean, there would still be obviously drug trafficking, but there would be peace. Like, are we talking about you get the, you bring the head of the snake back and things calm down underneath? That's a great question. So when Don Berner runs Medellin, as I say, from 1993, roughly to 2008, what happens in 2008? He's extradited to the US. Medellin has been in consistent chaos since then. Now we had a massive drug war immediately after his extradition as people tried to take the crown. 
it was this long, long drawn out uh, war between two figures within the NB office of Envigado. They think 4,000 people died in that drug war. Finally, one side, one of the capos took control, but it, he had bled so much for the crown, no one had to respect him. In my book, what's interesting is the trafficker I get to know, Alex, has this plan. His plan is he wants another war in Medellin. Why? Because there hasn't been a single leader of the drug world. All of these other independent drug traffickers have emerged in the shadows. And he wants to oversee, again, the dream is a deal with the government. He wants to get all of the drug traffickers to agree to a deal and then they can keep their money. Get out of the game, keep the money. But as long as you have all of these unaccounted drug lords, it's like, it's like the old cliche of herding cats. You can't get them together. So he wants a bunch of them killed in a war. Those left to come together as a kind of all agree, all in agreement, negotiate with the government. That was his plan. Um, so Medellin still to this day is in chaos. You have basically three drug cartels in that city. Another drug war is just a matter of time. Are there rumors of him potentially being released from prison, some sort of deal where he would go back and then, you know, sort of calm things down? I, I know efforts are underway to try and get Berna legally to get his sentence shortened.